But first, a short story. Have any of you ever just worked your tail off for a major presentation? Maybe it was with the corporate world at a business deal. Your whole year's commission or earnings hinged on winning that proposal. Or maybe it was a PhD defense for someone going through their orals, and you had thought of every possible question you might be asked. You were ready to go, and then you're asked a question you had not thought of. And even worse, it's a blindingly obvious question. That happened to me several years ago. I was conducting the research, which led ultimately to this book, uh, God at Work, the history uh, of the faith, uh, history and promise of the faith at work movement. And, and my professor at the time, and now a colleague and mentor and friend, Professor Robert Wuthnell, some of you may know him, one of the most prominent sociologists of religion in the country. As I was talking about the faith at work movement this and the faith at work movement that, he said out of the blue, well, David, how do you know it's a movement? Uh, I said, well, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to buy time. <laughs> and he said, well, maybe it's just a fad. Maybe it's just ethereal. Maybe it's this year's pet rocks. <laughs> I did not know what to say. I didn't know what a movement was. So that set my research back about uh, six or seven months, where I spent a lot of time in the library studying through the sociology what constitutes a social movement. Think of the civil rights movement. It changed the world. Think of the women's movement that changed the world. So I learned that although there's lots of theories about social movement, essentially the social movement, it, it, to meet the criteria, there's three basic criteria. Number one, first of all, there's no pope. No one's in charge. There's no central figure saying, we run this. We're author the author authorizing body or control quality control. It's a group of loosely networked individuals and organizations that kind of know each other, but they're all doing their own thing, just like the civil rights movement, in connection, but autonomous bodies. The second, they're all organized around a single common principle. In the case of the faith at work movement, it was a desire to integrate the claims of our faith with the demands of our work integrate the claims of our faith with the demands of our work. People want to live holistic lives, not compartmentalized or bifurcated or separate lives. If you could bring your dog to work, why can't you bring your faith to work? And the third criteria is, is that the responsible spheres of society who should be offering and creating the space and doing things properly to allow this felt need to be expressed and realized aren't doing their job. Just like the legal system, the judicial system had legalized racism in this country in the civil rights movement, they weren't doing their job. So a movement comes up to fix what society should have done and the, the domains of society should have done correctly the first time. So this is a social movement. The question is, is, is it still one? Well, let's take a look at that. Has it run its course? Is it, is it fading? Is it gone? Where will it go? I look at this through three lenses. First, as a scholar, which is my, what I do is my day job at Princeton University. I also look at it as a practitioner, someone who is involved in the faith at work movement in various ways. And finally, as a former senior business executive, where I understand the issues and pressures that people face in the marketplace. And I also understand them as a blue-collar worker, having worked shift labor in a factory when I was younger. Well, let's take a look. And the lens I playfully came up with or thought about was using Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. And we all remember mean old Ebenezer Scrooge, that terrible businessman. And as he had, he's visited by the ghost of his former partner, Bob Marley, and we have the ghost of Christmas past, present, and yet to come. I'd like to th think about the, the ghost of the faith that work movement past that we've been thinking about, present that we've seen these two days, and future. What is yet to come? Let's take a look at that. Well, with that rubric, uh, uh, we could take that back. We don't need that yet. Uh, the, let's define our terms for a moment. What is the faith at work movement? And a little secret that I think Greg mentioned earlier in our time together, this is not representative of the faith at work movement. We are but one sliver of it. There's not a lot of Catholics in the room. There's not a lot of mainline Protestants or Protestant groups in the room. There are, a lot of, there are not a lot of people in the room who describe themselves as spiritual but not religious. They're not here either. And oh, by the way, where are the non-Christians? They're also asking questions about meaning and purpose, the things that drive and wanting to live an integrated, uh, integrated life, the things that drive this movement. So they're not here, and let's not forget that. So the Faith at Work movement is comprised of a, it's not monolithic, it's not homogeneous. There are a number of lay-led specialty groups, some of whom are represented here today. Usually they're nonprofit, although increasingly there are some for-profit Faith at Work groups. There's parachurch groups, there's academic centers increasingly growing. And in the corporate world itself, let's not forget that, where people actually go to work. 
there are companies that are often privately held, privately owned, that might describe themselves as faith-based. They're very clear that they run their business on religious principles, Christian principles. And there's other companies, usually in the public domain, publicly traded companies, who are what I call faith-friendly. It's a term that's beginning to gather some traction, where everyone is encouraged and invited, not just tolerated, but invited to bring their faith to work, whatever tradition it might be, a faith-friendly model. Perhaps Tyson Foods, with 120,000 employees, is one of the biggest examples of that kind of a company, where they stay in their state, state in their core values. We strive to be a faith-friendly company. And there's one last place that we don't see, and that's people who are involved in the faith at work movement, men and women, who are not part of a group, but they're on the internet, they're asking questions, they're thinking about it, they're meeting in different places, or privately thinking about it, struggling and yearning, wanting to connect the dots between their Sabbath and their Monday workday. One other thought, as we think about the faith at work movement, where we're going and where we've come from, and that said, well, how do we even describe it? Uh, is it liberal? Is it conservative? Is it mainline? Is it evangelical? Is it Christian? Is it Jewish? I find those all interesting but unhelpful labels. And I prefer to look at it through the lens of what I call the four E's, or the integration box. And each of these four ways of manifesting faith and work take place in most faith at work groups and individuals. And oh, by the way, my research suggests we all tend to have a preference or natural inclination towards one of these four ways of integrating faith and work. The first I call ethics. For many people, integrating faith and work, it's all about your ethics. It's being, it's being just and honoring contracts and, being, and not lying and not misrepresenting things. So ethics is at a personal level, a personal probity, but also at an institutional level. Are the products and goods and services we're selling and producing, are they ethical? Are they God-pleasing? So ethics is one way uh, groups manifest their focus on faith and work. For others, it's expression, or people might call that evangelism either with words, verbally or non-verbally. That could be through a tire, it could be through a screensaver, it could be through something I wear or something next to my desk. For many people, when they bring their faith to work, they want to show it, they want other people to know it. Ethics, expression. The third category I call experience, experience. Do you experience your job as just a job to pay the rent and you really flourish when you're outside of work? Or is your job perhaps something holy? a vocation, a vocatio, something you've been called to do. And oh, by the way, it's not just glamorous work. Someone who works the shopping market till at an HEB grocery store is doing just as godly a work as someone who's a CEO or a hostile M&A taker. All have the potential to serve others in and through their work. And the final way to think about these four E's is, is the, the word enrichment. And that's where we turn to the inner soul, the, the balm and Gilead. Some people earlier were talking about it's the person who prays, gets up a little bit earlier, prays before a meeting, who prays at home, or meditates, or has other contemplative practices to stay anchored. It's a balm and Gilead. The workforce can sometimes, the work world can be brutal, cold, and chilly. And faith can often help people turn it to a place of light and warmth and hope. So those are different, four different ways to think about faith at work groups, those who are involved in those, and individuals is how we naturally do that. Uh, let's put up a slide here. As we go forward, there's really nothing new under the sun. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes tells us the faith at work movement, which I've been studying for the past, uh, it's past 150 year history or so. The questions, frankly, are very similar year in and year out, except social media didn't exist as a term 100 years ago. But here are some magazine covers you might remember. Fortune Magazine, Business Week, HR Magazine, and Diversity Inc., a big part of the faith at work movement we don't talk about. So we'll just leave this in the backdrop, integrating these two texts, the two Bibles many of us live by, the Wall Street Journal and the Holy Bible. So within the Faith at Work movement, I'd like to pause now and say, what's changed since our earlier research? Is there anything new that's going on? Well, it's comprised largely of clergy, of churches, uh, uh, that in, in the past, unfortunately, have not paid as much attention to this area. We've talked about that. That's beginning to change, but only nominally. There's also changing customer tastes the movement needs to think about. Changing customers' tapes, the needs, the profile, the generational differences, the questions the millennials are asking are different than the questions that the baby boomers ask. They assume integration, they assume alignment, whereas we struggle with wanting to find it. What about gender, ethnicity? The faith at work movement needs to really improve its game in tending to gender and ethnicity issues. Uh, and finally, there's a changing religious profile. Our office places and places of work are not homogenous anymore. Their immigration has changed that dramatically. 
Many of the groups might be too narrow in their focus of the four E's. Maybe they're f spending so much time in one area, they're forgetting that the millennials want a holistic life. They might be interested in all four E's and not just one of those four E's. And frankly, there's sort of an odd paradox. Sometimes we need easier on-ramps, we need to keep it simple, but also I think we need more robust resources, more robust theological resources. Many of us sort of go through a faith at work 101, if you will, but in fact, we have tougher questions. What about a theology of competition? What about a theology of outsourcing? In the 48 hours I've been here, I haven't heard the word profit, except spoken by my friend Bill Pollard. What about a theology of profit? How do we think about that in rigorous ways? So we can offer more resources. We could do better. Another challenge to the faith at work movement, what about the question of succession planning? Many of the groups represented in this conference and others have been founded by someone with a passion, a zeal. It's been laid on his or her heart to start a faith at work group. Sooner or later, they will retire or move on. Do those groups just fade away? Or will new leaders be raised up? So succession planning is something the movement needs to think about. I also wonder if the movement needs to be a bit careful about pride. Some of the greatest companies who have gone out of business is because of pride and arrogance. They thought they were better and no one could ever beat them. And this movement risks that same thing. There could be a certain theological smugness that my tribe has it figured out with a bit of disdain for other tribes out there. We can learn from each other and walk alongside each other. Oh, what about competition? Something else for the movement to think about. For those who aren't involved in a Christian context, which is the context of this subset of the movement, many Christians are flocking to Deepak Chopra or the consciousness movement. There are other viable alternatives that are being well articulated, well marketed, and well sold. How does the faith at work movement respond to and think about that? Oh yes, distribution channels. How do we get the word out? How do we pass it on to people? Distribution channels is an important thing. Social media will play a big part of that. And finally, philosophers call it the problem of the one and the many. How do we have a relational dimension to the faith at work movement? And yet, as good business people, think about scalability. How do we multiply this? How do we leverage this? How do we be a good steward and multiply it? And finally, there's things out of our control. There's judicial legislative things in the EEOC. We saw a little bit of that with Hobby Lobby, although that's not directly faith and work. But we're going to see more of that. Will that hurt or harm the presence of the faith at work movement in the workplace itself? Indeed, many workplaces now are having business resource groups and affinity groups that are faith-based. Ford has something called Ford Interfaith Network. HP, American Express, Deloitte, they all have faith groups, faith groups, where you can gather and use company resources as an affinity group, just like an African-American group or women's group or Asian group or others. And finally, where is, what's the non-Western face of this, movie, this movement look like? Yet to be determined. So I conclude that the, the factors which drew the, the, the faith at work movement to, to convene and start this current movement probably when the fall of the wall happened and AT&T laid off 40,000 people in 1989, that the faith at work movement is far from over. It's World Series season, my guess is we're somewhere in the, maybe the third inning of this, of this wave of the movement. But the challenge is, Will we turn, or the, 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 the question is, will we turn these challenges that I've just lifted, uh, referred to, will we turn them into opportunities, or will they sink us? I believe there's a huge opportunity for the faith at work movement to grow, to flourish, and make a huge difference in the world. I'll close with Tiny Tim's, a, a paraphrase of Tiny Tim's final words at the end of A Christmas Carol. God bless ye everyone with work and at work. Thank you. David, thank you very much. Hey, uh, I, I, I see a, a word up there that uh, um, it, it sounds German to me. I don't know. The Avoda. Yeah, it's German, yeah. Avoda. What is, what is the Avoda Institute? Right. So uh, there, am I on here still? Yes. So the, the Avoda Institute is something that actually Bill Pollard and I founded in, in 1999 when we first met and began uh, exploring this question together as uh, friends and, and partners. Uh, it's actually a Hebrew word. And it means three different things. If you read through the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, you'll find the root of that word means three different things. Sometimes it means work, as in working in a field. Other times it means worship, as in worshiping Yahweh, the King of Kings. And other times it means service. You remember that great Old Testament line, as for me and I ha my house, we will avodah the Lord. So I went to Bill, and we were trying to name the center we were putting together. I'll never forget this. Some of you may not know Bill Pollard is very shy, very bashful, holds his opinions back. I had to encourage him to get his view. And, 
And I had a friend in New York who did name research, corporate research for branding and names. And, and I asked Pat, would you mind taking a look at this? Uh, should we call it the Center for Faith and Work, the Worth and Faith Center, or Institute, all these words? And oh, by the way, would you throw in the word the Avodah Institute? Because I, that was my epiphany when I was in seminary in my Hebrew lessons. I fell in love with that word because that word is my life. That word is my story. Uh, so I said, Bill, uh, Pat loves the word. She thinks it's terrific. But she highly recommends against using the word Avodah as the name of the institute. And I said, why is that, Pat? And she said, well, you're going to spend all of your time explaining it to people. And Bill said, that's exactly why we should call it that. <laughs> so uh, I wish you all blessings as you find your avada, your work, your worship, and your service, uh, honoring God and uh, serving neighbor. Thank you.